Harper, Dean Rubin, members of the Napier Luby Bar Association, other members of the bench and bar, uh, friends from neighboring colleges and universities, colleagues, students, staff uh, from the law school and from across the Vanderbilt campus, and other guests. My name is Kevin Stack. I'm an associate dean at the law school. And it's my great pleasure this morning to welcome you to the 2009 Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, lecture and to introduce you to our honored guest, uh, Dean Melvin Oliver. Dr. Martin Luther King had a dream, a dream of America living up to its promise of equality. Our lecture today and this time together provides a formal occasion to reflect, to take stock, to ask how we're doing with regard to Dr. King's dream, and to do so with in the inauguration of Barack Obama just a few days away. Martin Luther King's dream, as Dr. King himself put it, is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. To be sure, one enduring feature of the American dream is itself rooted in home ownership. So we have occasion to ask, how are we doing realizing Dr. King's dream of access of all Americans to that uniquely domestic part of the American dream? And how are we doing in the midst of the most profound housing crisis in America in decades? Our, uh, our speaker's distinguished career makes him an ideal person to address these questions and to help us connect Dr. King's dream and the American dream. Dr. Uh, um, Dean Oliver is currently Dean of Social Sciences at the University of California at Santa Barbara. As an academic, Dean Oliver has received almost every form of recognition one could imagine. I won't list them all, but here are a few. He's been a fellow or scholar of the most prominent foundations for social science research in America, including the Rockefeller Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Ford Foundation. And I imagine particularly gratifying Dean Oliver's own alma mater uh, for his graduate work, Washington University, gave him their Distinguished Alumni Award in 2002. He's author of more than 50 articles, several books, one of which was republished in a 10th anniversary edition. Uh, as an engaged policymaker, Dean Oliver uh, was vice president at the Ford Foundation for eight years, heading up its asset building and community development program, one of the foundation's three primary programs, and overseeing an annual budget of $100 million a year. Following his remarks, Dean Oliver has agreed to take questions. Without further ado, would you help me in welcoming Dean Oliver? Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, every time I hear introduction, I say, who are they talking about? <laughs> well, I'm so pleased to be here today to talk to you about um, what, what I term um, the subprime nightmare, the black catastrophe that has occurred in America over the past several years, and to place it in a context of what has happened around um, African American economic progress. Um, this being uh, a lecture that really um, responds to Dr. King's life, it's important to recognize that King's uh, legacy is a contested one. Um, many people uh, like to point out that the core of King's legacy is about uh, moving past race, moving toward a colorblind society in which we view all people as equal, and we look at people by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. Of course, on the eve of Obama's election, we can certainly celebrate that in some ways. Um, many of us could never have imagined that an African American could be elected uh, president. But there's another side uh, to the King legacy, and it's the side that's really not that legitimate to talk about. And that is his, his side which really castigates America for its legacy of inequality and racism. And that's the side that we've kind of put aside and celebrated the dream of individual equality and not pointed out that what King's life was about was contesting inequality. Uh, we remember, those of us who, who, who know King well, that his biggest defeat was never in the South. His biggest defeat was in the North. And why? Because he went uh, to the suburbs of Chicago to promote fair housing. And 
he found out that segregation and racism was much more difficult to eradicate in the North than in the South, where he had, while a very difficult struggle, a victorious struggle against civil, uh, for civil rights. So I want to kind of come to that side, because I think if you look at the latter part of his life, uh, that was what uh, he was about. If you look at what he said on his last um, I've been to the mountaintop speech in Memphis, he said, let us keep the issues where they are. The issue is injustice. We've got to keep attention on that. So I think of this lecture is rooted in that legacy of Dr. King. Well, where are we at in America in terms of the economic situation of African Americans? I was uh, not surprised, but it's, it is a surprising feature that in, uh, 19, in 2005, the Pew uh, Foundation did a project on social mobility in America. And they discovered that white children are more likely to surpass parents' income than black children at a similar point in the income distribution. That is, if you look at a white kid at age 30, they are more likely to have passed their parents in terms of income than African Americans at any point in the, in the, in the um, distribution. So this kind of gets at that notion of what's happening to African Americans. We see mobility, we see middle class African Americans, but are their children able to consolidate that middle class status? Are they able to achieve what their parents have achieved? And as this shows, only 31% of black children born to parents in the middle class have income greater than their parents compared to 68% for whites. This is a kind of telling indicator. I don't like to look too much at points in a distribution. I like to look at intergenerational changes because that gives you the direction of where we are going. Um, what is the uh, reason for this? Well, my life's work has been around looking at wealth and assets. Um, in 1995, with my uh, colleague Tom Shapiro, who's at Brandeis, uh, we publish a book, Black Wealth, White Wealth, A New Perspective on Racial Inequality, in which we argued that assets were a, was a feature of economic status that was not really taken seriously by academics and policymakers. Economists often say, well, you know, assets are really part of the total economic package. There is a lot of correlation between assets and income, so we don't really have to kind of look at that. If you look at income, you're doing fine. Well, we argued that that's not the case, and that book really um, solidified or, I think, helped people change their perspective on that. And if you um, um, look at, um, as, as Kevin pointed out, we published a 10-year um, uh, anniversary edition in 2005 in which we added two chapters to accommodate the changes that had taken place in, in, the, in the preceding 10 years. And I want to kind of give you a sense of why assets are important because that goes into why the subprime uh, situation is, is so crucial. Um, we argue that there's really conceptual, theoretical, and practical uh, differences between income and wealth. Income is a flow. I like to say income flows into your pocket once a week, once a month, so, so many times a year, and it flows out of your pocket. Okay? It's what you use to achieve a certain standard of living, but it goes away because you're using it for consumption. But wealth is a stock. It's something that you preserve. It's something that you invest in. It's something that you build. And you build it because it helps you have a command over the future. You're able to use it if you have hospital or medical bills. You're able to use it to advance your children's education. You're able to use it to start a business. Okay? Wealth helps you secure life chances. Income helps you to preserve a living status. So there's a very different kinds of aspects. And the other part of wealth that I find most theoretically interesting, which I think has very, very important um, uh, practical and public policy implications, is that wealth is an indicator that captures the inequalities of both the past and the present. When folks 
focus on income, you're focusing on what an individual brings to the labor market and gets paid for with, from. I, I come to the labor market as a PhD and that's what I sell. But wealth is something that comes from a continuous accumulation over time. So that my wealth is dependent not just on me, but on, on what came from previous generations. And that allows you to capture the history of racism, uh, 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 economic uh, um, uh, 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 status um, for Americans and gives you a much richer sense of where people are at. Um, when we did the 2005 update, we looked at what had happened in America in that 10 year period. And um, many people have noted there's really two fundamental narratives. We've become much wealthier as families and households. Um, the prosperity of post-World War II America continued and probably even increased in that period. The median net worth of all families increased 39%. Net financial assets, that is cash, money that people can grab a hold of, not equity in homes, but just uh, cash, 60%. We've had mechanisms that have allowed people to accumulate uh, money in stock markets, uh, KEO plans for 1Ks, IRAs. But at the same time, we've seen a very a constant, a heavy concentration of wealth. The richest 5% of American households controls 67% of the country's financial wealth. The bottom 60%, 60% had 8.8%. The bottom 40%, only 1%. Very unequal. Okay. Now, for African Americans, the situation did not improve from the time we wrote Black Wealth, White Wealth in 1995 and 2005. We show data that for every dollar of median net worth that whites control, African Americans only had eight cents. Now let's put that in perspective. If you looked at income, African Americans was about 61%. So that's the sea change in how you look at the economic status of blacks. Eight cents compared to 61 cents. In 2006, it was about 10 cents not much of an improvement, and the gap increased from 60, about 61,000 to 83,000. A very stubborn persistence of wealth inequality in America. Well, what drives that? Well, for African Americans, what drives that is really home equity. Because home equity is the most important aspect of a family's wealth portfolio. But for African Americans, it's more important. 63 versus 38.5% of the total wealth of black and white families is held in home equity. So home equity is the key driver in whether or not African Americans have wealth. And what drives that? In large part, segregation housing segregation. We know segregated neighborhoods end up with less housing demand, lower prices, and therefore less equity. So even African Americans who have similarly valued homes in terms of the purchase price, if they're in white neighborhoods versus black neighborhoods, over time, white homeowners have higher appreciation and black homeowners have less. There's a historical context to this that's very important. Because I mentioned that wealth captures that historical dimension. Because wealth is historically con uh, con uh, constituted. It's not about me and what I have today. It's about what my parents were able to pass to me. If my parents didn't pass anything to me, the only thing that I can accumulate is what I can do in my generation. Okay, and so there are some very key concepts for understanding how these wealth disparities um, develop. One is the notion of cumulative advantages and disadvantages. Very easy to understand. 
if you start with zero, then over time, you have a cumulative disadvantage versus those who start with something. And in American society, white Americans have had um, what some have called locked in positions. Once you get something, you're able to maintain it. You're able to keep it. You're able to improve it. You're able to make it more uh, valuable. White Americans have been able to do that. And one scholar argues that what white Americans were able to do was to create a racial cartel. That is an exclusionary set of uh, material resources that African Americans didn't have ac access to. So if we look at the most recent figures, you see that 10 cents has gone down to 7 cents between 05 and 07. Okay? Now, I want to give you a sense of how that racial cartel is preserved. Um, this lock-in advantage that we talk about um, is, is one that comes from uh, the ability of some people in a market to lock out others in that market. The critical legal scholar Daria Rothmeyer uh, describes the long history of restrictive covenants. Those are legal mechanisms that say this house cannot be transferred in terms of ownership to anyone but someone of the white race. If you look at post-World War II America, okay, uh, I used to do this in my class. I would teach students at UCLA and 80% of them were in the San Fernando Valley. I would say, go home. This is your assignment. Go home. Have your parents um, uh, get their homeowner a contract. And just look at it and see if there's a racially restrictive covenant. And they would come home and say, it is there. Because in the San Fernando Valley in 1948, when African Americans were returning from war, they had GI Bill, FHA was there, there was no economic barrier to home ownership. You didn't have to have a down payment. All you had to do was be able to afford the mortgage, and usually the mortgage, the taxes, and the insurance cost less than the average apartment that were being rented in central cities. But in the San Fernando Valley in 1948, restrictive covenants made it impossible for African Americans to move in those communities. There was a locked-in advantage for whites. Likewise, racial zoning, redlining, steering, blockbusting, mob violence, all of these were mechanisms that preserved that exclusivity. Okay? And we could go on. Homesteading Act. The Homesteading Act allowed millions of, Amer of Americans to just move west, fight Indians, and get land. African Americans were excluded from that opportunity. Um, look at um, uh, farming policy in America. Uh, we know from the recent um, uh, settlement that um, the uh, Agricultural Dep Department has uh, accepted the fact that they systematically discriminated against black farmers in providing loans and the opportunity to buy more land. And of course, we've seen a decrease in the number of black farmers because of their inability to compete in a market that is very, very competitive. So all of these are uh, mechanisms that create that uh, cartel. Um, obviously, the most important one was Federal Housing Administration, FHA. And I've described that with the, with the, the notion of the San Fernando Valley and what happened uh, in that context. Oh, boy, I, I talk too much. Um, uh, it's, it's important to note on this that between 1934 and 1996, 98% of all FH lo FHA loans went to whites. Remember, these are the loans that you would expect to go 
to those people who have less. But for the first 30 years, FHA systematically discriminated against African Americans because they redlined at the communities that African Americans purchased homes in. So those, those communities were systematically uh, uh, disinvested. So housing plays a very big role in this asset inequality picture. Um, contemporarily, there are three mechanisms that create that. One is a discrimination in mortgage markets. Now, in my book, Black Wealth, White Wealth, I, I was one of the first people to try to quantify what the cost of that was. And so we looked at mortgage markets, and some of the studies pointed out that um, uh, a similarly qualified African American uh, homeowner was about 50% more likely to be denied a loan than the same white borrower. Interest rates, about a half percentage point difference between the average loan for African Americans versus whites. Now, this is before the subprime crisis. And of course, the discrimination in housing equity that I pointed out. So when you looked at that, um, there was about a 13.5 billion cost in terms of the mortgages that were denied African Americans, about $26 billion for the interest rate differential, and about $140 billion for the housing appreciation, uh, costing about $179 billion for just the current generation of homeowners, um, or about $18,000 per family. I made the argument, if you're talking about reparations, that might be a place to start. Um, well, that is before the subprime. You see how important housing is and how these changes have affected uh, African American wealth. But what about the subprime mortgage market? All right, um, I, I'm not going to go through this. This just describes what we talk about, what we mean when we say subprime. Higher cost loans, little or no down payments, high points and fees, prepayment fees, or adjustable rate mortgages. Those, those are the characteristics of um, uh, subprime mortgages. These were designed, of course, to give people who were considered to be um, good credit risk but didn't have the capital to be able to get into the housing market. Okay? Um, of course, they have had a very um, um, negative effect, um, and in part because of the way this was implemented. Um, the way this was implemented is that credit scores started taking the place of any kind of personal interaction. And of course, many of us, when we first started talking about credit scores, um, would argue, you know, it's better to have credit scores because you take away race. If you're just looking at a credit score, no one can deny someone a loan because they don't know their race. All they know is the credit score. But the credit score became, became a way for mortgage brokers who were very new to this industry to start uh, having an incentive to get anyone a loan that could afford it. They couldn't do it in the prime sector because credit scores left them out. Okay? But in the subprime, credit scores didn't matter. They could look at all sorts of other indicators. Many people said, oh, they paid their rent 12 months in a row. Well, of course they paid their rent 12 months in a row, else they'd be out of a house. Okay? That became the basis of a loan. And so in 2005, 60% of the subprime loans were placed through bro brokers compared to 25% for the prime market, for the major banks. So the incentive were to steer uh, buyers into higher interest loans that generate more fees because fees is what generated the mortgage broker's uh, um, um, interest in this. But the mortgage broker, all he dealt with or she dealt with was the buyer. Once the loan was bought, it went to the bank. And here's where it gets interesting, because the markets that ended up with those loans was global. Okay, um, Capital markets started uh, buying loans that were bundled into securities and hedge funds, foreign invector, investors started buying them and leveraging those loans. You've heard about that from derivatives to credit swaps. 
And the investor who buys them thinks they're buying something good. Why? Because the credit rating agencies have said, this is a bundle of loans that I guarantee to be a good set of loans. They have some bad loans in them, but they're out. You know, they're, they're more good loans. You've got great opportunity in buying this. The lender has no incentive to make a good loan because once he sells this to the bundler, it's out of their hands. It's gone. So you get all this money coming into the market and going out again, coming back, going out again. You have a tremendous amount of activity. Well, if you look at that activity, it doesn't look like much, but it's very significant. If you look at the bottom line, um, those are um, the subprime originations between 94 and 2005. Now, what's interesting about that is that it's pretty flat until about 2001. But 2002 to 2005, it jumps up quite a bit. Let me give you some figures on this. There was a 15-fold increase from $35 billion to $530 billion between 94 and 2004 in subprime loans from 4% of all mortgages in 95 to 17% in 2004 to 29% in 2006. Okay? Now, that, that doesn't look like much, but that's a lot of loans. The question is, who got those loans? Who were those loans given to? Well, interestingly enough, these were loans that I argue were stripping minority home equity. And if you look at it, I think there are two periods. There are the period 1995 to 2001 and then 2002 forward. Very different dynamics going on in those two periods. Uh, segregation aided mortgage brokers. Mortgage brokers want to look for buyers that they can get high fees from. Okay. Having segregated housing markets means I know where those people are. I can go get them. So if you look at Philadelphia in 1995, you had mortgage brokers going door to door, offering great refinance deals. Who would get a refinance deal like that? Well, elderly people, people who have had medical bills, people who have high consumer credit. Why? because those equity loans would help them consolidate their bills, have very low payments, but what they really didn't know, because a lot of this was predatory, is that they were gonna go up in price over time, they wouldn't be able to service those, they would lose their home, the equity would be sucked out from right under them, and those folks are in trouble. So, I argue that between that period, that was when this industry sharpened, refined, really figured out how to do this well. And um, they were targeting older, older residents, minority residents. And I was, I was the vice president of the Ford Foundation at that time promoting home ownership. And my, my, my um, grantees would say, we're promoting home ownership and next door, people are losing their homes because it was two different markets. We were promoting home ownership with prime loans. They were promoting home ownership, or actually not promoting home ownership. They were giving loans to people who they knew couldn't, uh, couldn't pay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go uh, through a lot of this because I am, I'm, I'm, I'm going quite um, it's quite long. Um, one of the things I want to point out is that I mentioned prime loans. Prime loans tend to come from the major banks that are under CRA obligations. And one of the biggest uh, canards that are going, that's going around now is that CRA contributed to the subprime crisis. Well, CRA had nothing to do with the subprime crisis. CRA ob obligates banks to make affordable loans to high-risk lo uh, uh, homeowners. 
but those are home, those are loans that do not go into secondary credit markets. They stay in the bank. They were competing against subprime uh, uh, loans, and they could not compete. They were being outperformed because people would say, well, you're offering me this loan, I have to pay more money. Why shouldn't I go to this subprime loan and pay less? And you would try to explain it, but people see less. Okay, so when you look at um, subprime loans, 75% are issued by independent mor mortgage brokers, not covered by CRA. CRA did not have an impact on this. Okay, um, I'm going to give you a, a little example. Um, if you look at Atlanta, Georgia, and you look at high minority tracks, 40% black and Hispanic, and you look at tracks that received above market shares of subprime loans, look how they overlap. Now, what's interesting about that is that this is not a new phenomenon. This is a carryover from the same patterns that were established by FHA loans. Jesus Hernandez, a, a wonderful young scholar, has found that subprime loans were disproportionately found in areas of Sacramento, which is what he studied, that were redlined in the 40s and 50s. Okay? Tracks with a history of racially restrictive covenants showed far less use of subprime loans. Subprime loans are just reinforcing the geography of racial inequality that was institutionalized by FHA. If you look at the foreclosure crisis, you find that African Americans, Latinos are all um, more heavily affected. I'm just going to focus on that last one. 2.2 million borrowers who bought homes between 86 and 2006 will probably lose their homes. $164 billion of wealth will go down the drain in those losses. Okay. One in 10 African-American borrowers are going to lose their home compared to one in 25 white mortgages. Um, there's a strong spillover effect. That is, if a home in a community is foreclosed on, the neighbors will have a decline in housing values of about 5,000. So when this happens a lot in one community, it doesn't affect just the person who is foreclosed it affects the whole community. Um, I walked um, uh, precincts for Obama in Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm from, uh, for the election. And I would get a list of homes and addresses of people who hadn't voted in the last election. I was trying to get them out to vote. 50% uh, of those homes uh, were either boarded up or gone. <clears throat> That's what happens in communities in which you have high foreclosure. Okay, I'm going to go to the end here. So what, what is happening as a consequence of this? Well, obviously we know that the subprime uh, crisis had a lot to do with the credit crunch that um, hit us, and we responded in a very vigorous way with a $700 billion TARP program, tar Troubled Assets Relief Program. 350 billion of it's already out there. Uh, Obama's requested an, uh, the additional 350 billion to be released, but there's no accountability here. No one knows where these funds are. No one can tell you what they've gone for. There's no measurable impact on the families affected by the subprime crisis. We've bailed out large private entity, entities like AIG and semi-public corporations like Fannie Mae. Uh, this is supposed to restore confidence and security sold and insured by these institutions. And it's supposed to prevent the collapse of the US economy. A lot of money there, OK? We're going to change regulation. We're going to have reform, OK? But no one knows really what that reform is going to be. Uh, no one's really outlined it. Uh, we have a modern financial service regime that is trying to run as fast as, as it can, but it doesn't know what it's doing. 
Um, if you think about it, there are four pieces of legislation that really set the stage for the subprime crisis. Um, the Depository Institution Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1911 eliminated state interest rate ceilings on home mortgages. Used to be there was a ceiling and you couldn't go above it. Well, subprime could not exist unless they could charge a higher interest rate. Second, the Alternative Mortgage Transaction Parity Act that preempted state statutes that regulated alternative mortgage, tra mortgage transactions, such as balloon payments, variable rates, and ne negative uh, amortization. Without those getting rid of, people couldn't come up with these creative kinds of home loans. Uh, third, the Tax Reform Act of 86, a very big driver because it eliminated the deduction of interest from consumer loans and enabled homeowners to deduct interest from home equity loans. So if you have an 18% credit card uh, interest rate and you buy, get yourself a home equity loan and pay that off, your interest on your home equity loan is deductible. So it is an incentive to go for home equity loans or refinance loans. And finally, the Graham-Leach-Bailey Act, which really facilitated the ability of large institutions to do all of these things. So, you know, you have your Merrill Lynch, you have your Citibank, they can do everything now. It used to be you couldn't, if you were a bank, you couldn't be in the, in the business of, of um, uh, uh, securities and insurance. Now they do everything. And that's part of the set of issues. So what are the new opportunities in the age of Obama? Uh, this I want to leave you on something that we, I think, can do. They're not easy to do, but I think you can do. Obviously, regulatory reform of financial services and capital markets has to be done, but it has to have an objective. And of course, the objective we're talking about is keeping us afloat. But that objective also has to mean that credit is fair and sustainable for everyone, particularly for marginal, marginalized groups who need it most. One of the sad things about this is that we are starting to think of this as a problem of bad borrowers. Now, certainly there are some bad borrowers, but this is a problem of bad loans, not a problem of bad borrowers. And if you focus on it as bad borrowers, you're going to end up keeping those borrowers out of the market. And the object is, how do you bring them uh, products that are fair and can sustain them? Second, and this is my very special uh, niche on this, I think this is an opportunity to revamp the mission of Fannie and Freddie Mac in ways that make it responsive to federal law. And what federal law am I concerned with? I'm concerned with federal law that requires that all spending related to housing be subject to fair housing requirements, including the requirement to affirmatively further fair housing. This is directly out of the Fair Housing Act. Okay. We told Fannie and Freddie, you don't have to do that because you're not a government agency. Okay? So Fannie and Freddie, they didn't care how they continued to reinforce racial segregation in their loans. But now we own them. They are a federal entity. They should be responsive to the law. And that, I think, is one of the big opportunities that Obama has. And finally, we need to be responsive to the people who are really in need. We need to immediately put in place mechanisms that allow distressed homeowners to negotiate lower interest rates so that they can either maintain their home ownership or sell in a market whose prices have stabilized. This is a tragic crisis, but it's not unsol unsolvable. We have so many challenges facing us, but this is right in the center of it, so it's an opportunity. Let me end on King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which once again goes to his most important legacy, injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Could he have described the subprime mortgage mess any better? Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, I'm sorry I'm so long-winded. That's right. So you really want to get yes. rid of the estate tax. Is, is, that, is that, or not necessarily get rid of it, but, but sort of. You want to get rid of, you want to get. Sorry, you want to increase the estate tax. You want to get, you want to get rid, here's where I, what I would say. The estate tax right now, we have, we're, 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 yes. We have, we have a situation in which we've reduced it tremendously. Right. On the docket is to make that permanent, right? So my desire would be to go back to where it was. Yes. Uh, that, that's, and I figure, you know, I mean, we've talked about Obama and on these issues as well. Obama is, 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 is and what is attractive and what makes him a kind of a, a populist in the, in the bigger sense of the term is that he wants to meet a lot of people halfway, you know? And halfway is sometimes good, but halfway usually isn't. Um, and um, I think Obama needs to, and we need to think about Obama as how do we push him and how do we prod him um, toward the more transformative uh, positions as opposed to the populist positions that, you know, 60% of the people care neither strongly one way or the other, and it's just the people on the, the ends that, that, that matter. And on this issue, I figure that. Um, there will be a, a lot of pushback from the constituency that wants to go back. And partly, you can now argue that on the basis of, of budget uh, deficits. You know, this is a, that's a very costly cut uh, for the estate tax, and we really need those funds, as well as the justice issue, in the sense that these are people that um, really are passing on um, unfair advantages, not uh, fair advantages. Uh, two brief questions. The first one is Obama um, is asking for the additional $350 million and saying that he wants to go directly to the constituencies who are losing their homes. Yes. But from your structural viewpoint, um, what impact will that have on the structure that has caused the problem in the first place. Second question is related to what is the effect on black women vis-a-vis -vis black, uh, black men? Okay. Um. Let me go to, to the structural issue um, first, because I think this crisis has, has several dimensions, one of which is about structure, but one of which is about there is a, there's a lot of pain. So I do want those monies to alleviate the pain. If you alleviate the pain, you may not attack the structural basis of it. That's where you get yeah. the that, That's right. Then you have to figure out how you can be transformative. And I think the kinds of ways I'm talking about makes a possibility for transformative change within the context of meeting people's pain. Um, it's always difficult um, when, when, when there's a direct um, uh, issue on the ground that requires remediation that if you remediate it, you take the pressure off to change. And so you have to keep that in mind. And you also have to have a vision. And this is what I'm not sure that Obama has. You have to have a vision of what that structural change is. And I'm not sure that he has that. Um, and, I, and I worry that there's a, a larger vision that makes all of these kinds of visions less likely. But that's, once again, a political question. And it's a question of you know, getting your perspective out. Um, let me talk about women. Because um, women have been uh, some of the prime targets of subprime lending. Um, so that's why it's very important to kind of make sure that uh, those, those women uh, have some relief. Now, you know, 
the really, and I, we, we're not able to actually quantify this, but if you look at those two periods I talked about, the folks who got predatory lending, they've lost their house. They're gone. They're out of this equation. Okay? And that was when no one cared about it. Okay? So right now, my, 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 my um, thinking, because I don't have the, the, the data, and let me say something about data, because data is interesting. Okay? Um, this data is available. And the data is available um, from uh, uh, private vendors who service mortgage and securities and banks. And as, a, as part of the Ford Foundation, I gave money to grantees so they could purchase this data because it's very expensive. Okay? And that data has individual characteristics of homeowners. The data you get from the government does not have individual characteristics. It gives you the place, but it doesn't give you the characteristic, the actual individual characteristic. So the Center for Community Capitalism at UNC uh, got this data and they started doing the analysis. This was early on. And they saw these effects, these horrible racial effects. But when you, when you buy data, you enter a contract saying that the vendor has the right to review. And the vendor refused to allow the publication of that information. So we don't have that kind of good data. We need that data badly. Now, if I were involved with Obama in a different level, I would certainly push for the release of that data so we have the full magnitude of these uh, distributive uh, effects. But we do know that women have been a, a heavy part of it. The other thing that gives you a sense of this is that when, when, um, when I was with the Ford Foundation, I funded the largest single grant ever given up to that point, $50 million. And this was one that I, went, I, I had nightmares about. It was, it was to center for, uh, um, it was to a, a local um, uh, finance, uh, community finance institution in, in, in North Carolina. And uh, they had a very visionary leader, a guy named Martin Eakes. People know Martin Eakes? Anyone know Martin Eakes? Martin is very visionary. Uh, he started his, um, his financial uh, institution with a bake sale, $300. And when he came to us, he had a portfolio of about $150 million in, in mortgages for low-income folks in North Carolina. And he was on Fannie Mae's advisory board. And he showed them the data that they had, which showed that they had lower uh, rates of delinquency, lower rates of foreclosure than prime loans. And when you looked at his portfolio, it was a lot of single parent households, heavily African American. When you looked at Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae, who was the largest securitizer of mortgages, they had a 2%, 2% African American mortgages. Okay? All right. So Fannie said, this is interesting. You know, we'd like to study this more. And they, they came to us with an agreement. Give us $50 million, and you are insuring us against loss, and we will give loans and share our data with you so that we can understand how these loans um, work and how they perform. Well, we did that. By 2004, we had over 200, uh, what, we started out, it was going to be $2 billion worth of loans, $6 billion worth of loans in this program. These loans were having less defaults than prime loans. Okay? What's the difference? Well, they were just like prime loans. They had a conventional interest rate. They were low down payment, but they were also hooked in to community-based organizations that supported people, helped them figure out what they needed, what, what home ownership was about, 
Okay? Now, when you looked at that, 60% were single women. So you know that's the market that the subprime people have gone after. Uh, I'm sorry, I talked too much. No, uh, uh, this was uh, such an engaging and interesting presentation. It's, it's uh, unfortunate to hear such gloomy news. But you see, we do, ha we do have opportunities. Uh, but also to hear uh, the, 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 some, some directions for where we can move forward. So if you can uh, join me in uh, thanking Dean Oliver. And also, for those of you that don't have class and have a little time, we have a brief reception outside. So uh, please join me in thanking Dean Oliver.